Today on FIFA America, we have a very special guest joining the channel. Maxwell is here to talk about the U.S. Men's National Team latest round in World Cup qualifying and to help us zoom out on the world football stage, find the biggest stories that have been happening while we've all been focused on the U.S. Men's National Team. Maxwell, how are you doing, man? Welcome to I'm, the channel. I'm doing pretty good, man. How about yourself? Yeah, doing well, doing well. Happy that you are here. Happy that we can make this work. I appreciate and, you uh, for having me. Yeah, I know you do a lot of video essays. So tell the people before we get started, like, who are you? What's your channel about? Why are you here today? So uh, I'm Maxwell, or better known on YouTube as Maxwell. Um, I guess that's just because if you put Maxwell as a YouTube channel name, it's not going to be easily searchable. Um, I usually do, I guess, just football content, just in general, anything like current events. Um, but the main thing I'm most notable for is my video essays where I'll just take like really any topic that I think should be covered more and I just make it into an entertaining little storytelling uh, video. And uh, th those have done really well, especially the one that really kicked it all off, which was the U.S. failing to win the uh, to uh, qualify for the World Cup in 2017. Yeah, we're all we're all pretty mad at you for that one, just to make <laughs> us relive relive that time in our <laughs> lives. But uh, awesome channel, guys! Before you even watch this, go to Mac Maxwell's. I was going to call you Maxwell. <laughs> go to Maxwell's channel. I'll put the the link in the description and. Yeah, congrats on 50,000 subs, by the way. That's an Appreciate awesome it, accomplishment. It. Thank you. All right, so we've all kind of been focused on the U.S. Men's National Team, and I'm sure you have been as well. There's a few just funky things that have happened through the last qualifying window, whether that was the weather and the environment in the last game against Honduras, whether that was Greg's comments after the game in Canada where he said we dominated a game where we lost 2-0. Like, what were your general thoughts on the window? And was there anything that really stuck out to you from a USMNT perspective? General thoughts on the window has made me realize that it'll be very exciting to qualify for the World Cup. Being in the World Cup, even if you're a, you're a nation that isn't going to do that well, it's still a very exciting feeling. But then you get past that kind of stuff and you get past all that and see all the expectations with talent that we do have. I mean... It, that window showed us that there's a lot of improvement that needs to be done. And it just feels like Greg's kind of reached his limit in terms of what he's capable of. He just rides on the coattails of this talent. And if we see this in the World Cup, I mean, we're going to be out of the World Cup almost immediately. That's that's how I see it so far. What are those things that need to be improved? And do you feel like it's it's too late in the process to change before we get to the World Cup? Or should the U.S. Soccer Federation be looking at okay, let's qualify with Greg, let's reassess where we are. Yeah, and then in terms of things that we'd want to improve, I definitely just say overall the fluidity, it, it doesn't feel there whatsoever. It just feels like McKenney's doing his own thing in the midfield. It just feels like everyone is just playing on individuality. There's no you know team that I feel in this at all. Um, that was felt through Canada when we could barely get anything going on in the attack. I mean, pretty much every single game, I think, even... Even Honduras at times, I felt like we were just really not there, especially against the Honduras side that is just terrible. Like, this is the worst Honduran side in so long. The El Salvador game uh, really showed um, the flaws, and then Canada just exposed them even more, I'd say. Um, and then another thing is our attack. You know, we have a proven, well, not really a proven striker, but a striker that I'd say can prove himself later on in the future, Ricardo Pepe. He didn't play whatsoever, really. Um, I think I agree with Greg in the case that there's a lot of pressure on him, especially with that 20 million move to Augsburg. But at the same time, I don't know. It just I feel like that also kind of dips his confidence as well. Um, and another thing, like if, if we're going to continue to play Zardes, uh, I mean, don't expect anything in our time. Just don't, you know, it just yeah. feels like two wingers and nothing else. Like Zardes is just invincible, invisible. And I saw a decent bit of potential from, I think it was Jesus Ferreira against El Salvador. The issue with him was the, that he kept going way far deeper into the pitch than he should have. Because it just, once again, left us with two wingers wondering what to do with the ball besides crossing into nothingness. Um, so really, I think it's just the attack that really needs work there. The defense, I'd say, has been pretty good. Miles Robinson, I'd say, has been probably our best center back so far. 
but yeah, uh, another thing else to actually, um, <laughs> I need more Joe Scali. I just need <laughs> some fullback that actually can cross the ball. Anthony Robinson is phenomenal for Fulham. I've watched some of his games. I've seen his performances. If we can get that out of him, that'd be great. But right now, it's just, I, I just, I just want to see someone else different. You know? Yeah, especially from that right side. Dest mm-hmm. wasn't really doing it. He wasn't getting, I mean, he had one cross that meant that Jesus Ferreira could get on the end of it, but mm-hmm. he missed that chance right in front of goal. And then Reggie Cannon, I mean, did not have a great offensive game. He played well defensively, but it was also against a team that was horrible, couldn't qualify no matter what they did. <laughs> and their coach was saying that, you know, this isn't about anything other than suffering through this game. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't have expected it to be an, an explosive offensive performance from Honduras in, in the first place. What about from the coach's perspective? Like, is is it too late in the process for us to look for different options for Greg? Or do you feel like one, one problem, and not to lead the witness too much, but one problem I've always felt with Greg is that he doesn't necessarily um, reflect on what he could improve on. Like you kind of see consistent roster construction issues or consistent Mm -hmm. issues with the attack and how fluid it is. You mentioned that as well. Like, is it too late to look for a replacement? Or if it's not, do you have faith that Greg can kind of reflect on these performances and improve what's what's going wrong? I've just seen so much of Greg and Greg Ball, really. Uh, (laughs) I just, I, I don't really have hope or much hope for this guy. I think, like, I remember someone... Uh, on social media saying this like this guy loves the u.s national team i I don't think there's a doubt without there um but outside of that i I wouldn't say he's like right for the job i mean you get hired for a 69 percent win percentage um at columbus crew i mean it it really says a lot It, it sums it all up there um in terms of like changing coaches if we did it right around now I don't see too much of a problem. There's still at least like a month away. And as long as it's a coach, like a proven coach and not some bullshit MLS decision, right? I could see it working out. But also at the same time, I don't think it's going to happen because right now we are still second. And I think those higher ups will only see the fact that we are in seconds and they're not going to do much there. If we were like far down in like fourth or fifth, say like a Bruce Arena type situation, it would make sense there. Uh, for the higher ups to just take him out. But besides the fact that they're hearing people not happy with how the team is playing, they're seeing that second place. They're seeing something like a qualification and a little bit of profit. And that's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. And two trophies from the summer as <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. beating our rivals, Mexico. So I feel like he's built up a little bit of favor with the people mm-hmm. that are making the decisions of the coaching staff. And you're right, second place isn't the worst place in the table to be, but we do have a very difficult road in the last three games, whereas the the teams below us, especially Mexico, after we play them in Azteca, have the easiest road to get to qualify automatically. Okay, if Greg were to leave, then do you have a preference for which coach could take over? Because it's not necessarily a guarantee that Jesse Marsh or someone else like Matarazzo at Stuttgart or and it may, could be American, could be David Wagner, could be someone else that's not American. There's not necessarily a guarantee that they could come in and immediately make an improvement. Do you have a feeling towards which coach you would want to see as the U.S. men's national team coach? You know, I will say this as a joke, but um, <laughs> Zinedine Zidane is on the market, I am just saying. <laughs> Slash S. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think Jesse March would be, like, he has an identity, at least, in terms of his tactics. Like, we saw that against Leipzig. It didn't work out, obviously, but, you know, he has that distinct counter-attacking Uh, mentality and that's something that I really noticed we lacked uh, throughout these last three matches and it would be cool to see some of that fluidity be injected into the attack with Jesse Marsh Um, to be honest I really can't think of any other uh, coach at the moment um, that we could bring in I have just heard a lot of links from just Jesse Marsh a couple from Wagner as well that's uh, that's pretty much it Yeah, young boys seem to be doing well in the league. They Mm -hmm. beat Manchester United in the Champions League and did themselves favors, at least in terms of having good exposure moments. And we have Jordan P. Falk there as well, uh, contributing as a striker. In terms of the window, again, there are a few stories there. I know you're someone that really loves to just really focus on stories. Mm -hmm. Are there any 
are there any storylines that are coming out of this window that are kind of like your favorite or you want to do a bit more digging on and, and find out what's really happening? So there's one that I actually forgot to put in my World Cup review today, and that was the whole El Salvador situation. Where... So this is an exclusive. Yeah, this this was an, <laughs> this is an exclusive. <laughs> no, but so I don't know too much about the situation, but I guess there was some disagreement between the teams and the federation, the El Salvadorian federation, about like how much they were being paid or something like that. So that, that was definitely pretty interesting to me. I guess like um, one of the biggest things that happened this window for me, at least, was the fact that after seven defeats um, in the final round of qualifiers, Vietnam finally got their first win. And I mean, it, it was beautiful because it was against China on Lunar New Year. I mean, you could not write a better storyline there for the Vietnamese team. Um, it was also the first time a Southeast Asian team has won in the final round, which is a huge deal because one, Southeast Asia, not exactly at the levels of East Asia or West Asia, I guess, like the, the Middle East area. So it's a huge deal for us, um, especially knowing that we did it before Thailand. So um, <laughs> as they are our rivals that just beat us in the, in the regional cup, then I'll flex that as much as I can, you know? Yeah. So in terms of that, let's, let's scope out a bit. Cause I want, I really want to use your expertise in terms of what's happening on a more global scale to help U S men's national team fans who have been really, really focused on the CONCACAF Ocho. Mm -hmm. What, what else is happening in the world that we need to be looking at or like, what are those feel good stories? You mentioned Vietnam. I, I kind of want to give you just like runway to talk about what that whole situation was and, what it meant to beat China on Lunar New Year. It was it was pretty crazy. First off, like I I had kind of caught up with the team because before I wasn't making football content, so I couldn't really do anything there besides just look at the score lines and just kind of assume they were doing well or not. When I started following this team again, following their journey through the last round of World Cup qualifiers, just the fact that they actually made it to the final round was crazy. And when you read into their story of how they overcame so many things throughout the um, the 20th century, whether it was war or sanctions, all that kind of stuff, um, it really put them behind. Um, the team didn't exactly start playing until I think it was 1991. I, th I think this is just such a cool rise kind of story for Vietnam, even though there is still a lot to improve, uh, especially the fact that we don't exactly have a foundation for you know youth or anything. There have been clubs and media companies that have done more than the Federation, because the Federation, let me tell you, if you think nepotism is strong in the United States Soccer Federation, oh, Vietnam is a different story. <laughs> so we're lucky. Yeah, because there are literal government, I mean, I think the chairman, he might have left a couple weeks ago, but he was the um, the VFF president. And uh, already that's not really a, a great sign. So there is room to improve. Um, but for now, you know, I think we can be happy with what we've seen. And we still have a team that I think, you know, they've gotten the experience. And hopefully just as long as we get past the second round again for 2026, I, I could I could honestly see potentially Vietnam in the next World Cup. Not this World Cup, but the next one. So it's it's really cool to see. And as someone who is a Vietnamese American, I mean, you know, identity has always been like such a huge thing for me when it came to the sport. It's kind of why I love this sport so much. There's no other like how I see it is football is kind of a universal language. Like anyone can just see a ball being kicked and just enjoy it, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's just really cool. That is one thing that I wanted to focus on for you, especially is like, where did that love for soccer come in? Was it the identity and finding kind of the basic foundational principles of of soccer and world football or? Did you play when you were younger? How did, what's your soccer story? So it's actually kind of funny. I started watching in 2010, uh, which was the World Cup. So this was like, the, like no one, no one watched soccer in the country at all at this point. And I, I just remember um, the first player I ever knew was uh, David Villa, or as I like to call him back then, David Villa. So <laughs> um, I don't know. It, when I saw him play and saw those goals, it was just so cool. And I, I kind of wanted to replicate that. I never played the sport. I um, I was honestly terrible at it. But, like, I always pretended to, like, be these players. I was only, like, nine years old at the time. Um, but I, I will still always have, like, those special places in my heart for, like, Landon Donovan's goal against Algeria, 
Um, I think it was Michael Bradley for Slovenia. You know, those those were so cool. And I, I don't know. To be honest, like, I just got into this sport. And I just enjoyed it and just continued to watch it more and more. Um, there wasn't many ways to watch it on TV back then. So I grew up, for the most part, um, watching Messi and Ronaldo comps on YouTube. And from there, it, it just kind of grew my love. I think later on when you grow up, uh, especially, you you start to learn like how much it means to you in terms of identity, especially uh, as someone who isn't just American, you know. But even then, like if you are American and, you know, I, I think even then that's that's pretty cool because uh, not many people, or at least this isn't the most popular sports. And it, it's just a sense of uniqueness, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually saw... Someone on Twitter, I think it was Jay Hernandez, that talked about being from a household that lived and died with the game in a Hispanic household. Now he feels like he feels the game differently. Do you feel like that's true for you just, again, like spanning different identities and having such a close connection to the two teams? Yeah, I, I think it's really cool. I think another thing is like the growth of the sport just in general. I I never got to experience um like a like a soccer country environment type deal or at least not until now really so um my childhood was never filled with that but I, i'm really happy to see like those kids nowadays who are into this sport um they have something uh, there you know they have an environment um they're, they're not like seeing other people refer to this sport as sissy soccer like the fucking <laughs> south over here so it's just it's really cool you know yeah, what what are your opinions then of Major League Soccer and kind of its standing in the broader U.S. landscape? So for me, I have never particularly gotten to the MLS just because there is no local team. Like we just got one this year, which is exciting. So I'll be following. Where are you, by the way? Not uh, to Charlotte. Uh, dox you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, we've had rumors about an MLS club, club coming here. Uh, since 2017 i remember there was like this little rally uh mls to clt type deal in 2017 i didn't get to go but i really wanted to go i found out maybe like 10 20 people went um <laughs> but you know now that david tepper has kind of backed this project um we're starting to see more of a fan base and there's tons of ultras groups and we haven't even started which is pretty sick um but in terms of the mls um i'd say like from 2010 to about now, I've definitely seen a lot of improvement. There was that stage where it felt like a retirement stage, but now it, it does feel like a proper league where, you know, players like young players are being honed into, you know, what they dream to be stars of the sports. Um, I'm not really good at wording things, but it's, um, <laughs> That's okay. yeah, so I, I think MLS has improved on that stage in terms of like uh, how the clubs play, just the play style overall. I can't say much there, obviously, because I, I just don't watch it anymore. All right, but I, you will, and it's local to you next year. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's on my local channels now too, which is pretty sick. <laughs> there we go. You you are a true wordsmith, by the way. Don't don't worry about. Uh, <laughs> everyone feels that way, but even with things like Jesus Ferreira becoming a designated player for FC Dallas, it's like someone that's twenty one. Mm -hmm. grew up in the academy uh, and he's the first one to become a designated player in the team that they grew up in the academy for so even there we're seeing strides of young players that are maybe like before if you wanted to make a true living you know making millions of dollars being a soccer player you need to move abroad mm -hmm. and now there there is at least a pathway and someone you can look at to say that person went through the academy played for mls and then got signed to a designated player contract Mm -hmm. I, I do like the fact that there's more of a pathway now than ever. I still think there's problems with like pay to play and stuff. And it just stops yeah. a lot of people from actually playing this sport uh, professionally. I also think that like, okay, this might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion. Not too sure here. Sometimes I feel like the draft actually hurts the league uh, personally, just because one, I think the idea of just using franchises, like the franchise system for the MLS kind of hurts the league that way too, because you only have a hub for about 25 plus clubs. And those local clubs, although they do get attention, they don't get enough attention to really grow the sport as much as we want to see it grow. So if um, I'm reading into your comments, you're 
if we were to start all over again without the billionaires and millionaires that control the MLS yeah. teams, you would be a proponent of promotion and relegation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think with promotion relegation, not only would that be exciting for the league, but also it improves just all the teams in general. I get that infrastructure definitely isn't there, especially now more than ever, because I mean, the MLS clubs are so far um, above the US and all of those USL clubs and all that. Um, yeah. But, you know, with promotion relegation, you can at least see some slow improvements. You can see youth academies from other areas that may not be as popular start growing. And, you know, the more opportunities for players, the better. I, th I think with just college, I, I don't think exactly the draft would be a terrible idea. But I just feel like colleges in general don't invest enough. Yeah, you know? even the rules aren't the same. Like yeah, if exactly. you've ever watched college soccer, they have unlimited substitutions. The <laughs> clock counts down and stops <laughs> at zero. Yeah. So it's it's not the same sport almost. You don't need to think about your stamina or how how much you're managing your energy and your players. It's it's very different. Obviously, there's a ball, there's lines, there's two goals. Is there anything else in the world that we should be looking at or excited about? I think just Conmobile in general is going to be an utter bloodbath come March. That is one qualifier, like the entire, um, I guess, uh, window there. Like I am going to keep track of uh, common vocal qualifiers the best I can, because there's still three spots remaining. I think there's like four or five teams that can still get these spots. It's, it's gonna be crazy. It, it really will be. And then of course you have the African playoffs where um, Senegal just beat Egypt and AFCON. They play again, by the way, twice in March. <laughs> Egypt's going to be out for blood. I, I genuinely cannot wait for that matchup. And of course, you have the European playoffs where Portugal and Italy are in the same path. So one of those teams is not qualifying. I wouldn't exactly count out the other teams like Turkey, who anytime there's no expectations for them, they do well. It's the weirdest thing. Um, North Macedonia is a team on the up they will play with their hearts on the line, especially for a berth in the World Cup. So that's really exciting. Scotland and Wales, I'm actually half Scottish, so it, it'll be pretty cool to see if uh, Scotland make their way to the World Cup. It, it, it's just a lot of stuff that's going to be fun to watch in March because that's when it decides like most of the teams besides, I think, I don't know, like less than 10, I'd say. Yeah, so Oceania also has their playoffs, I think, which is a a tournament style in Qatar that they're going to have. And then that yeah. winner will play the fourth place of CONCACAF. So yeah. hopefully all of what you're <laughs> saying is like, if the U S can qualify after Mexico or Panama, then we can all kick our feet up and watch these crazy situations play out <laughs> for the rest of the world. No, I've heard um, from the OFC region. Uh, some commenters have told me about this one striker from the Solomon islands. Um, I looked at his stats. He hasn't played for the senior team, but for, I think, like, the U19s or something, he has, like, 19 goals and 14 appearances. So I wouldn't exactly count New Zealand as the, like, confirmed spot just yet. So who knows? Anything could yeah. happen there. Um, it's it's going to be exciting, man. Like, there's, there's no words to really describe it. It's just going to be all-out chaos, and I just cannot wait. What a perfect introduction to the March window <laughs> we got there. Thanks so much for joining the channel. Maxwell, tell the people what you're working on right now and what they can expect from your channel in the next few weeks. Yeah, so uh, right now I, I'm probably lying to my audience as we speak, <laughs> but I am trying to get a video essay out by Saturday. It's about Vigelta Sendai, a club in the northern region of uh, Japan. They, of course, you know, uh, in 2011, there was an earthquake like, and a tsunami as well. And this club and their supporters were able to pretty much bring a community together. And it really is a beautiful story that I hope yet again can be out on Saturday because it is a story that should be told more. Um, the funniest thing about this is um, as, as someone who always is so intrigued by the stories of the earthquake and tsunami, like all these stories of uh, people surviving, people who um, have lost loved ones, um, it, it is pretty cool to see at least some kind of positive in all of that. And um, the funniest thing about this was that all I did was just one day on Wikipedia, I was just wandering around the J League uh, season, saw a club in like the northern region of uh, Japan, was wondering, okay, well, what does this club have to do with anything? And then, you know, I just saw the uh, earthquake story. And from there, I just dug even deeper. And uh, yeah, so it, it should be fun. Should be fun. 
you got caught by the Wikipedia wormhole. Wikipedia <laughs> is so fun to just fuck around in, man. It, it's not even funny. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll find some more worldly soccer stories and we'll see some more video essays from you and your channel soon. But thanks so much for joining us, for spending the time and Thank telling us everything me. that's happening um, outside the U.S. Men's National Team. We'll see everyone next time. Peace.